uh, as we get into our topic today, uh, Dr. Bickman, m many of you know his book, uh, Why We Get Sick. And uh, I'm going to have our team pull up a little PDF, uh, a couple of slides, because our topic today is, is a really interesting one. Uh, in Dr. Bickman's book, and you can learn more about his book at InsulinIQ.com, there's a little tab there where you can learn more about, about Ben and about his book. Inside of his book, um, on page, I think it's 74, uh, he talked... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I wish I could <laughs> remember every page. I'm going to have uh, our teams... Yeah, page 74. There's a, a neat thing that we talked about uh, among the coaches this week, and it kind of became part of the discussion that we did in some of our coaching sessions with our clients this week. We talked about fructose and fatty liver disease, and uh, if I have, I'll have our team scroll down. So it, at the bottom of this little, this page in Ben's book, uh, he says, uh, in referring to fructose, other than sugar, which is half fructose, the culprit is largely our love of fruit juice. Many of us consider it a healthy drink, but all fruit juice is, is a potent source of pure fructose. Hopefully this prompts you to think twice before drinking that cup of apple juice, let alone giving it to your kids. And finally, at the bottom, uh, Ben goes on to say, this is not, however, a call to avoid fruit. Because of its fiber content and relatively lower fructose, whole fruit is very different from fruit juice. In fact, eating whole fruit is better for improving diabetes risk than drinking juice from the same fruit. So if uh, Ben has said many times, if you're going to have fruit, eat your fruit and don't drink it. <laughs> So that's, that's true. <laughs> with, with that as a little bit of a setup, you know, we've had this discussion this week and, and uh, Ben said, hey, why don't I talk about that on the metabolic classroom this week? I'm going to turn the time over to Ben. He'll kind of frame up this discussion uh, in his laboratory and the metabolic classroom. So Ben, go right ahead. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, guys. Really, th this is such a fun opportunity for me to to sort of play the role of professor, which is something I, I genuinely enjoy. So, uh, guys, really, thanks for humoring me. And anyone listening, thanks for tuning in. And uh, be a good student and ask some questions if anything comes to mind during this uh, bit of the, the discussion that, uh, that we have now. So uh, to put things in context, Jack, you queued it up well. And just to add to that, people may be listening to this and thinking, uh, well, I don't have fatty liver disease, so it's no problem. Um, more people have it than 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 they than they realize. It is the single most common liver problem in the world, in the world. If if, if we're worried about liver problems, uh, fatty liver disease is number one, and it's kind of a gateway problem. Just to put things in perspective, someone may think, well, that's fine. If I I have a little more fat on my body, I have a little more fat in my liver. It's okay. It's just fat. That's not true. It's it's what the concern is what it progresses into and what starts as fatty liver disease can progress into what's called non um, alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is when the liver at first it's just fat, then it gets fat and inflamed and then it can progress all the way to cirrhosis, which is kind of fat inflamed and scarred. And now once you've included that scarring, now you're doing some irreparable damage to the liver. So uh, fatty liver disease is really a gateway problem. And again, more people have it than realize, and it's, it's, it's uh, sobering what it turns into. In fact, it's such a common problem that when people are trying to find liver transplants, they're, they're running out of liver donors because so many people have fatty liver problems and they just don't know it. And so our actual pool of, uh, of people who can donate a portion of their liver is shrinking as the livers are getting fatter. Yeah, uh, ben, frankly, ben, let me interrupt you one second. Um, mm -hmm. I all, uh, just to, to chime in, I read an article uh, just the other day. In fact, I think I saw the link to this article from one of your followers on Instagram who linked to an article uh, that, that talked about the epidemic among young people with yeah. fatter, fatty liver disease. That's right. Yeah, even in kids. So it's the most common liver problem in the world. That's not just adults, it's kids. And I am, based on what we'll discuss today, I think everyone will be able to agree, it is, it is totally what we're feeding the children. And it is this uh, heavy, heavy focus on fructose and just sugar in general, which I'll tr attempt to keep as a part of the conversation, because that's, that's relevant uh, when we talk about fructose. 
So there are three studies that I thought would be helpful to just touch on lightly to really set the stage, because I know this is debated. There are people who, in, especially in the low carb community, who will say uh, fructose isn't that bad. And the only evidence suggesting that fructose causes fatty livers is in rodents. And it, it, in, in humans, the evidence just uh, isn't there. And so I made sure to just strictly focus this discussion on human studies. And the first one was an article published a few years ago. It was in 2009 in a very good journal, the Journal of Clinical Investigation. It's one of the better biomedical journals out there. And there, there are several outcomes. In each of these studies, there were other outcomes that I won't touch on, including lipids, uh, really looking at the changes in blood lipids, which is interesting, but a topic for another time. Uh, but it is relevant because the liver makes the blood lipids uh, for the most part. Triglycerides, LDL, VLDL, it regulates HDL levels. So the liver is, is very much at the crux of, of those processes. So uh, that uh, having been said, this first study took people and over a course of, of 10 weeks changed their diet to keep it isocaloric. So they didn't want the people to be eating more calories than they were before. But what they had them do was start consuming 25% of their calories from either just pure glucose, so a pure glucose solution, or a pure fructose solution. And Jack, you mentioned it well, and we were talking a little bit beforehand where, where Rich asked about the relevance of this. Uh, the pure fructose consumption is very relevant. This is fruit juice. That, that we're drinking all the time. And, and I, I felt very compelled to point that out in the book because as a parent and, and seeing what is what we're told uh, in, in, through marketing, uh, what we should be feeding our kids, a very well-intentioned parent would be thinking, my kid wants soda pop. Of course the kid does, every kid does. I'm not going to give them soda. I'm going to give them fruit juice and I'm a good parent. I'm doing my children a favor by doing this yeah. little realizing that that you are giving them pure fructose that is exactly what we're talking about in these studies now what would be more unique is someone drinking pure glucose that would be uncommon but when someone is drinking something with sugar in it like a soda that is a mix of glucose and fructose so throughout these two studies i'll highlight where we're causing fatty liver in people um, they're doing it in a glucose group versus a fructose group. You could imagine that when someone's drinking soda, they're getting the, the both of these. I would say the best of both worlds, but it's really uh, the worst of both of these outcomes. They're combining. You could you could really consider that you're combining the negative effect, uh, effects of the glucose and fructose insofar as you're, you are getting it together in sugar, which you get a lot of in soda. So this is relevant uh, I believe it's something that is very, very common. The liver problem is common, and I think it's because of the consumption of, of fructose and sugar, which is a rich source of fructose. So back to the study. They took these people for 10 weeks, and they were getting 25% of their calories from glucose or 25% of their calories from, from fructose. And we're going to attach links to these studies. So uh, any listeners that go in and find the links, just remember, this is the study that was published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation. So the, the first, um, or really the main outcome that I want to focus on is, is expressed in table three and in figure one. But basically, they measured the actual, in the, in the first, in the table, they measured the cubic centimeters of fat. So the actual like volume of the fat um, around the central part of the, the, the abdomen, they measured the extra abdominal fat, which is the subcutaneous fat, the fat that would be around your waist that you can pinch and jiggle. And then they measured also the intra abdominal fat. That would be visceral fat. That is the fat that is beneath the layer of muscle on the stomach. And so this could be the guy um, who, you know, you imagine two men who have fat bellies. One of them has a fat belly that hangs down and it's wiggly and jiggly. That's the subcutaneous or what they're calling extra abdominal fat. And then the other guy has a big round belly, but it's hard. It sticks out rather than hangs down. That's more reflective of visceral or as they cite in this study, intra abdominal. And what was so interesting is that in both of these studies, in both of these groups, uh, drinking the glucose or the fructose, both of them got about the same uh, um, degree fatter. Although the fructose drinking group had a little more total fat um, than the glucose-containing drink. 
uh, group. And then the difference, although it tended to go up in both of them. Um, and then uh, what we what was interesting was noting the differences in those two fat depots, the intra-abdominal or visceral or extra-abdominal or subcutaneous. And th uh, what they found was that the glucose drinking group uh, selectively had more of their fat accumulating in the subcutaneous space. So it's that pinchable, jiggable, a uh, jiggy, jiggy, jig. What, what's the word? I like jiggable. <laughs> jiggy, jiggable. Yeah. yeah I don't, jiggly, jiggly. Hey, that's ben, what I was trying to say. Hey, ben, I'll just show you mine. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> no, Rich, don't break up any happy marriages. We don't want to, <laughs> we don't want to make the other men upset. Uh, Jack and our fragile egos can't handle you showing off <laughs> exactly. your shirtless body. Uh, so, but we compare that with the fructose drinking group who had relatively more of their fat, indeed a significant increase in their visceral fat. Now that's as far as that study went. I'm just highlighting that to set the stage that the glucose drinkers and the fructose drinkers both had more fat over the 10 weeks, actual physical volume of fat in their central abdominal area. The glucose drinkers had more of it in their subcutaneous and the fructose drinkers had more of, it, more of it in their visceral. Now visceral itself can can really encompass a lot. It can encompass both fat within the tissues like the liver or fat literally around surrounding the tissues like omental fat. So they didn't, they didn't tease that apart. Now let's go to the next study then. And this is a study uh, where the title is the effect of high fructose weight maintaining diet. And um, that's how it starts. This was published in another very good clinical journal, the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism in 2015. Same intervention, 25% of the, of the calories were now in this study coming from fructose. That's just, that was the only arm. And then there was just a control group, which was getting a comparable amount of carbohydrates, but it was coming from complex carbohydrates. So fruits and vegetables. So, uh, but once again, isocaloric attempting to maintain weight. They, they, so they weren't trying to make them lose or gain any weight. Um, the results of this were, uh, once again, pretty, pretty telling, where, and we can see this very um, easily in the abstract, they looked at two measurements of liver uh, fat regulation. One was the degree to which the liver actually started making fat from, from scratch. And, and when, when we're making fat from scratch, that's generally coming from carbohydrate. That's really the backbone of what the liver will use to make new fat. And then in addition to measuring liver fat production, which is called de novo lipogenesis or the, the creation of fat from, from nothing or from scratch uh, or you know, new. And then, then uh, they, they also measured actual fat um, within the liver as measured by uh, an MRI like scan. So they measured the, the, the degree to which the liver is making fat and the degree to which the liver is actually getting fatter. And this was just a few weeks. And over the, uh, in fact, just about a week and a half, um, they, they did this fructose um, intervention group. They found that after this period of time, the group that was containing 20, drinking 25% of their calories from fructose, their liver was making about uh, almost 80% more fat. So the de novo lipogenesis had been activated by about 80% uh, higher than in the control carbohydrate group. And the actual amount of liver fat went up by 137%. So they more than doubled. They more than doubled the amount of fat within those livers during this period of time, just by shifting the bull, uh, a portion of their calories away from even normal carbohydrates into uh, just fructose. And this really would be something like someone just drinking a lot more soda or a lot more fruit juice. And, and, and they do that with the best of intentions, of course, including making their own. And there's so many times I've had people ask me, well, I don't buy juice at the store. I juice it at home. Your liver doesn't care. Yeah. Uh, and and, and to, to the book's point, before I get into this last study, um, it, it's, uh, it, it, I, I say uh, when I defend fruit, because I think fruit can be part of a healthy diet. When someone's drinking a cup of apple juice, it's like someone would have to go in and eat four apples or five apples. And, and you would never do that. You would just get sick of the apples long before you got through apple number five because of all the substance and even just the labor of chewing it. Uh, you would just get tired of the apple. But when you drink 
the juice from five apples? Oh, you could do that in a few gulps and you'd be asking for more. We have we change the nature of that fructose. So I don't intend for anyone to hear me uh, to, to think that I'm just waging outright war on fructose. No, as a species, we've been eating fructose for millennia, but albeit very, very infrequently, especially compared to how we eat it now. Now, all of this, so these two studies emphasize that you can take a, someone and have them eat fructose and make them get fatter in their visceral space and specifically in their liver by over double within just about a week and a half. So there's no question this is relevant. It happens. Here are the studies to show it. Now, the follow-up study is kind of the good news. And, and this was a study, it's called the fruitless study, uh, which is really clever, isn't it? <laughs> it's published by the American Society uh, for Nutrition. And this was just published at the end of last year. So this is the most recent of all. And this was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, which is the um, journal for the American Society of Nutrition. It's their official journal. This was a bigger study. They took, it was almost 50 individuals that had confirmed fatty liver disease. They used something called the fatty liver index, but they also were measuring actual liver fat through um, magnetic resonance, like an MRI um, type strategy. And they split the people up into drinking glucose as a portion of their calories, once again, or drinking fructose um, as, uh, as a portion of their calories. And over the, let me scroll down to it. They found in figure two, if someone goes to that, they confirmed that the fructose consumption had dropped precipitously in the low fructose group. So they were sort of shifting between these two interventions. What's so interesting is that BMI itself didn't change, um, although it came a little close, um, but uh, also cal uh, caloric intake did not change. So this was not a low calorie. They were just shifting the fructose and glucose consumption. And then in figure three, they measured intrahepatic lipid or the actual amount of fat within the liver. And they found that the group that was shifted onto the low fructose diet had a significant reduction. And this was a p-value for those that care of less than 0 0.001. That's pretty impressive in a human study, especially of one that, was, that contained less than 50 study subjects, the fact that it was that significant suggests that it was a pretty real phenomenon. And the reduction was about uh, 25 to 30%. So after just this, this short intervention of cutting back the fructose, um, they were able to reduce the, but not all carbohydrates, but they were able to reduce the fat within the liver by about 30%. And again, just by cutting out the fructose, putting them on a very low fructose diet. So the takeaway from all of this is if someone knows they have fatty liver disease or they suspect they have insulin resistance, which then very likely suggests that their liver is getting fat, you don't need to make it very complicated. Uh, it's, it's just this, this first rule that I think is, is necessary for improving the health, which is controlling carbohydrates. Part of that is, as I outline in my book, don't be so sweet. Just avoid those sweet things, and that means avoiding fructose, because if it's sweet, it's fructose in nature, and, and that's going to be you avoiding the culprit, uh, the, the main driver of, of your fatty liver problem. Hmm. Hey, Ben, Ben, what are the long-term effects of having a fatty liver? Yeah, yeah. So it's really what I outlined earlier, the progression of NAFLD or fatty, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Then it progresses, toward, progresses towards uh, steatohepatitis, where it's fatty and inflamed. Then it's cirrhosis, which is inflamed and scarred. And then it's cancer, potentially. That's really the progression. And I meant what I said, fatty liver disease in, it, in and of itself is you would make the case, and I would, I would agree, it's, it's benign. It itself isn't going to kill you. It's a gateway problem at the liver though, not only in the liver, but as the liver is getting fatter, it's very likely becoming increasingly insulin resistant. And that, when the liver becomes insulin resistant, that's one of the key tissues if, within the body that flips the switch, as I say, flipping it from just insulin resistance or prediabetes up to actual type two diabetes. When the liver's becoming insulin resistant, it starts pumping, releasing glucose like gangbusters you know, thereby driving up the blood glucose mm. and then getting diagnosed with type two. Yeah. You want to take a few questions? We've got some questions related to this topic. Mm -hmm. 
from, uh, from Michelle. How long does it take to reverse fatty liver? I've been keto and carnivore for three and a half years. I had an ultrasound that showed mild fatty liver disease and mild to moderate fibrosis. The question is, how long does it take to reverse fatty liver? Yeah, well, this study found significant reductions, about 30% in liver fat after just, I think it was two weeks. Um, six weeks, sorry, it was six weeks, more, more than I thought. So uh, after six weeks of just low fructose, it went down by almost 30%. So I, I guess we, I, I don't know whether, I'm sure there's a diminishing returns or the rate of reduction starts to slow down. Mm -hmm. But I would think within six months or so, that's a problem that you would could have resolved. I know Robert Sywest, the gastric um, bypass surgeon, who he he has a big voice on the internet. He talks about when you go in for a gastric bypass, fatty liver is a big problem. They need to get your liver, uh, your fatty liver, under control so that they can see everything and do the surgery properly. And he talks about how. He just puts people on like a broth for two days and it, it controls their fatty liver pretty quickly. So mm -hmm. I've always thought it was something like insulin resistance or insulin, at least levels, you can reverse very quickly, but you know, you might have to over time, um, play around with what you're doing and maybe incorporate some fasting to kind of see the benefits of it long-term. Yeah. In, fa in fact, I love that you mentioned fasting. One worry I would have is that most of the fat that is stored in the liver comes from fat flowing in the blood, whether it is fat being released from fat cells as free fatty acids, or whether it's triglycerides coming from liver, uh, coming from the diet, like uh, from chylomicrons, from what we're eating. So I, there, I, I could imagine a situation where someone goes really very, very low carb, but is still very high fat or even higher calorie in general. I am, I'm a bit, I think focusing on calories first is not the prudent strategy, but when it comes to clearing the liver out of fat, I could imagine a problem. If you are eating too much fat, uh, you might want to, you know, actually go through that period of fasting. So I could see why Robert um, would kind of go on a, you know, extremely low calorie diet for a couple of days. Uh, I think uh, when it comes to the liver, it's so good at pulling in fat to store, although that is accelerated with insulin that it, might nevertheless be prudent to focus on fasting for at least a period of time. Yeah. 